Good morning, everyone, on this beautiful early spring silver day, a time and the season of the year that always signals the annual Blackboard Jungle Symposium. My name is Nancy Matthews, and I'm the Dean of the Rubenstein School of Environment and Natural Resources. And it's my pleasure to welcome all of you to the 13th annual Blackboard Jungle Dean's Breakfast. Our week-long symposium has been focused on reimagining an inclusive community, and this morning's Dean's Breakfast keynote will welcome Dr. Eddie Glaude to speak about new America, new beginnings, how our conversations about the past direct the future. Before we get started, I'd like to pause to recognize and acknowledge the historical occupants of our land. UVM is located on the land which has long served as a site of meeting and exchange among indigenous peoples for thousands of years. It is the home of the Western Abenaki people and UVM honors, recognizes and respects these people as traditional stewards of the land on which we gather today. It's in the spirit that we acknowledge that we are guests and we strive to respect and steward the lands that we use today to the best of our ability. So a few thank yous this morning. I particularly want to thank my fellow deans for their support of this annual breakfast, even if it's virtual. Uh, while it's always a highlight of the year to have a real breakfast together, I hope that each of you are having your cup of coffee or tea wherever you are during this virtual breakfast. And I wish to thank the conference organizers in the Office of Vice President for Diversity and Equity and Inclusion for their exceptional organization this year and technology planning. Last, I wish to thank my friend and colleague, Dr. Wanda Heading Grant, for her vision 14 years ago to carve out time, space, and an opportunity for this important gathering. We have all been inspired by her leadership, energy, and passion, and we aspire to live up to the expectations that she helped to establish for each of us in our UVM community. So just a reminder, everyone here is a participant and can use the question and answer feature to submit questions and that captioning can be turned on and off with the instructions provided to the chat. Yesterday, the senior leaders at UVM engaged in a heartfelt conversation with Dr. Louis Versailles about our own racial identity. These conversations reaffirmed to me the importance of each of us engaging in our own personal work, lifelong work around power, privilege, and identity. And while my Dean colleagues and I have positional power as campus leaders, it does not mean that we have all the answers about difficult topics such as diversity, race, and racism. Far from it. The example that we all set by engaging in these difficult conversations about equity and personal identity sets the tone for the entire campus. It's my hope and certainly that of my colleagues that with each day, month, and year that passes, we continue to dismantle the barriers and boundaries due to skin color and identity. It is also our hope that all members of our UVM community center equity in our daily lives as we move forward. It is now my honor and privilege to introduce Provost and Senior Vice President Patricia Prelock to also welcome you to this morning's event. Provost Prelock was named the Provost and Senior Vice President of the University of Vermont in November 2019. Prior to then, she served as Dean of the University of Vermont's College of Nursing and Health Sciences from 2009 to 2019. This is also her academic home where she served as a chair of the Department of Communication Sciences for 2002 to 2009. Dr. Prelock is a recognized expert in the nature and treatment of autism spectrum disorders and has received numerous teaching, research, and service awards at the University of Vermont. Please join me in welcoming Provost Patty Prelock to welcome all of you to this morning's session. Thank you, Nancy. And thank you for that nice introduction. I'm delighted to be here this morning to participate in the Blackboard Jungle 13 Symposium. I've attended this symposium for many years. It's something I valued when I was a faculty member, and then as Nancy said, when I served as Dean of the College of Nursing and Health Sciences. I'm so happy now to be participating as Provost and Senior Vice President. And a very special thanks to my colleague and friend, Vice President Wanda Heading Grant for her vision and leadership around this very important event. And a big thank you as Nancy provided to the entire team of a talented individuals who've made this symposium possible. The creation of this signature university event reaffirms the university's commitment to our common ground values, justice, respect, openness, integrity, responsibility, and innovation. 
In my role as provost, it is my responsibility to support the university's academic mission and to foster an environment of inclusive excellence. Our commitment to diversity and inclusion is reflected in our inclusive excellence plans, in our academic success goals, and in events such as this that provide opportunities for thought-provoking discussions. Central to the success of the Blackboard Jungle Symposium has been its ability to bring people together. Through our collective exploration of complex histories, realities, identities, we expand everyone's ability to teach, to learn, and to work. Although I know we would prefer to be together in person, we have been able to find ways to share, to connect, and to grow in this virtual environment. Throughout this week, the symposium presentations offered a foundational understanding of what it means to be culturally competent and tools that will help us create a more informed, inclusive, safe, and welcoming educational environment. I hope that you will be active and intentional participants in this symposium and that you will make use of what you learn. The presentations, I hope, will also facilitate your evolving cultural humility, that lifelong process of self-reflection and self-critique on not just understanding other cultures, but self-examination of your own beliefs and cultural identities. Together, we can reimagine an action-oriented, inclusive community characterized not just by working to achieve cultural competence, but through establishing a cultural humility that helps us understand and appreciate the impact of different cultural identities, including our own. Now I would like to introduce Dr. Randall Harp, who will formally introduce our guest speaker. Dr. Harp is an Associate Professor of Philosophy at the University of Vermont and is this year's Fulbright Canada Pierre Elliott Trudeau Foundation Fellow and Joint Chair in Contemporary Public Policy. With research focusing on the philosophies of action and behavioral and social science and social metaphysics, Dr. Harp is also interested in the concepts of agency and behavior and the ethical implications of how information about us and our networks can be used to predict and influence our behavior. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Harp. Thank you very much, Dean Prelock. And it's my great pleasure to introduce our Dean's morning keynote speaker, Dr. Eddie Glaude. Junior. Now, there, there are a couple principles for introducing a keynote speaker, right? Now, the first thing you want to do is you want to communicate to the audience in case they don't already know why this person is interesting, right? You want to remind them why, in this case, they gave up their eight o'clock on a Friday morning time to be here. And the second thing you want to do is you want to prime the audience a little bit about what the ideas are that they're going to be hearing so that they're able to understand or recognize those ideas a little bit more easily. Now, the first problem is an easy problem. And in fact, this is one of the easiest introductions for a keynote I would ever have to make, because you guys already know who Dr. Glaude is. If you don't, you don't have any books, you don't watch any TV, you don't pay attention to the news. You already know who he is. But I'll read a little bit of the blurb anyways, although I was tempted to just say nothing. And if you somehow didn't know who he was, you would be in for a treat. But I'll read a little bit of the blurb anyways. Eddie Glaude Jr. is an intellectual who speaks to the complex dynamics of the American experience. His most well-known books, Democracy in Black, How Race Still Enslaves the American Soul, and In a Shade of Blue, Pragmatism and the Politics of Black America, take a wide look at Black communities, the difficulties of race in the United States, and the challenges our democracy face. He is an American critic in the tradition of James Baldwin and Ralph Waldo Emerson. In his writings, the country's complexities, vulnerabilities, and the opportunities for hope come into full view. Hope that is, in one of his favorite quotes from W.E.B. Du Bois, not hopeless, but a bit unhopeful. He is the James S. McDonnell Distinguished University Professor and Chair of the Department of African American Studies a program he first became involved with shaping as a doctoral candidate in religion at Princeton. He is former president of the American Academy of Religion. His books on religion and philosophy include An Uncommon Faith, 
a pragmatic approach to the study of African American religion. African American religion, a very short introduction, and Exodus, religion, race, and nation in early 19th century Black America, which was awarded the Modern Language Association's William Sanders Scarborough Book Prize. He's the author of two edited volumes, many other influential articles about religion for academic journals. He's written for the likes of the New York Times, Time Magazine. You've seen him on TV. Okay, yada, 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 right? Lots and lots of distinguished academic credentials. And some of that, some of those claims might be opinion. Here's just straight fact. He has one of the best bookcases in the Zoom game. So yeah. if you've ever had a chance to just like look on in his bookcase, you can always find something interesting there. I have gotten quite a bit of education just at looking at some books, seeing some stuff and going and reading them later. It will help you out. So that's who he is. What about the ideas? And I will let Dr. Glaude talk about them more fully than I will, of course. But one of the things that Dr. Glaude has argued in Democracy in Black and also the most recent book on Baldwin is that if we want to understand where America is right now, we have to grapple with what America is and always has been. And that there's a gap between our vision of who we are and who we actually are, right? We can call it some kind of value gap. And democracy is about a collective articulation of our values. And there's something, of course, valuable in the democratic project. But the truth is that American institutions have always been built around the principle that Black lives do and ought to matter less, right? Not that they do matter less, but that they ought to, right? That's it. And we can't tell ourselves stories about how good we are as individuals or about the progress that we have made as individuals or even as the nation without grappling with the fundamental fact that our institutions have been built around the principle that black lives do and ought to matter less. And this is part of the reason why some of the focus on a kind of progress story or about recognizing that any one of us individually might not harbor racist attitudes or views, why well, that just doesn't answer the question because the institutions are still built around the principle that black lives ought to matter less. Mm. And Dr. Gladys turns attention recently to Baldwin or I mean, rather he's turned our attention back to Baldwin. Uh, you know, I'm sure he's been thinking about Baldwin for a long time and this is not a surprise right? because ba Glaude's thoughts about America have been clearly informed by and in the vein of Baldwin's view, although to be fair, right? All of us are in some ways living in Baldwin's America, whether we're aware of it or not. But Dr. Glaude helps us to become aware of it and helps point us a way forward. And you know, maybe he won't say it, but I will, right? Dr. Glaude is not just in the Baldwin tradition or in the Emersonian tradition, but he's very much an inheritor of the intellectual mantle of Baldwin and Emerson. And that's why I'm particularly thrilled that he is here with us today. Now, there are a couple of extra principles for introducing a keynote speaker, right? One of them is just don't overshadow the keynote speaker in your introduction. And sometimes I worry about that. I have no worries in this case, right? Dr. Glaude is a magnificent speaker, extremely charismatic. He will be great. But the fourth principle is just get off the stage, right? And so I am now happy to get off the stage <laughs> and welcome Dr. Glaude as the Dean's Morning Keynote for Blackboard Jungle 13. Dr. Glaude, over to you. Thank you so much, Dr. Harp, for that wonderful introduction. Uh, my goodness, um, I mean, I, that was really, really good in terms of laying out the overall project. It's a delight to be here with you this morning. I can't read with my glasses, so I have to take them off. Um, so uh, I'm delighted. I wish we were together uh, sharing breakfast, uh, but uh, times are what they are. I want everyone to be safe. Uh, I want to thank uh, Vice, Pro Vice President Dr. Grant and Dean Matthews and Provost and Senior Vice President Prelock for uh, uh, all the work they've done in their previous comments. Uh, I want to thank the folk behind the scenes who are making sure this webinar uh, uh, goes smoothly. Anytime I'm near technology, there's always a chance that it might collapse. So this is a great thing. Uh, so let me just jump into the talk and so that we can get to the conversation. I wanna begin with uh, two epigraphs, two quotations, uh, one by James Baldwin and the other by William Faulkner. Baldwin wrote, it is terrible to watch people cling to their captivity and insist on their own destruction. I think black people have always felt this about America and about Americans and have always seen spinning above the thoughtless American head, the shape of the wrath to come. 
That's from No Name in the Street. And Faulkner, the past is never dead. It's not even past. From Re Requiem for a Nun. So I want to offer a few preliminary remarks this morning about where we've been and what we've done and who we might aspire to be, especially in light of what has transpired last night and over these last few months. Just last night in the state of Georgia, we saw Governor Kemp sign legislation that in effect disenfranchised or at least attempts to disenfranchise uh, large numbers of Georgia voters, particularly voters of color, more specifically black voters. And I think it's important for us to understand that this particular action, which is one among many, we now know that there are over 250 bills submitted in legislature, state legislatures across 43 states that aim to do something similar, that it's important for us to understand this act last night and these acts across the country as extensions of what happened on January 6th, when a mostly a mob of mostly white men and women sacked the US Capitol. Now, why would I connect these two? There's a sense, at least in my view, that the attempt to limit the franchise, to in some ways reduce the power of a particular segment of the American citizenry, that that is in some ways a reflection of a certain view of who matters in this country. As Dr. Harp rightly put it, I hold the view that America has in some ways been shaped by what I call the value gap, this belief that white people matter more than others. And that valuation evidences itself right, in not only our social and economic practices, but in our political arrangements. It is the driver of the distribution of advantage and disadvantage. And what we see uh, in these efforts to disenfranchise people of color in 2021, mind you, we are talking about voting rights in 2021. What we see is this belief that this country must remain a white nation in the vein of old Europe. Now, why, will I, why should I connect this? Would I connect this to what happened on January 6th? Again, a mob of mostly white men and women sacked the US Capitol. They roamed the halls of the people's house and declared that they were there to stop this quote unquote steal to act as patriots on behalf of a country in peril. And Americans watched as Capitol police were overrun, as Officer Sicknick was killed, and as some among them, even as they were fighting back, some seemingly agree with what was by any measure an insurrection. And as I watched that moment, I couldn't help but think at the time of police of the police response to the protest after the murder of George Floyd. And I think we need to brace ourselves because that trial begins on Monday. Of course, there was violence then. Minneapolis had exploded, but I recall the peaceful marches and how they confronted a militarized police force, rubber bullets and tear gas, images of police aggressively accosting protesters. On January 6th, some, as some police officers risked and gave their lives in defense of the Capitol, we saw others taking selfies and even one officer helping a woman walk down the steps of the Capitol, holding her hand. She was a part of the group that stormed the building and was now simply walking out. It was an astonishing representation of a different register of civic expression of those who have the right to dissent without fear of police and those who can claim ownership of the country. Fascinating. Now, in many ways, the insurrection on the 6th and these attempts to disenfranchise Black voters and what Governor Kemp signed last night, I think all of these are logical extensions of the conservative counter to the Black freedom movement of the mid 20th century. For well over 40 years, we've been living in that reaction, I believe, as some railed against big government and so-called entitlement programs where privatization became the response to public ills and as others built the carceral state that has resulted in the incarceration of millions of Americans, mostly 
black and brown and poor, we have witnessed over these years, the evisceration of any robust conception of the public good as the idea of citizenship has given way to the notion that we are all self-interested persons in pursuit of our own aims and ends in competition and rivalry with others. Some scholars like the political theorist, Wendy Brown, describe this as the political rationality of neoliberalism, however you describe it. It has been one of the enduring legacies of Reaganism. Alongside the flattening of wages for working people, the skyrocketing of student loan debt, the precarity of the planet, we have witnessed in so many ways, right, working people barely holding on as the rich has continued to extract resources for themselves and the rest have struggled to keep their noses above water. This was the reaction to the demand for a more racially just America. In some ways, the dismantling of the great society and a wholesale attack on the very framework of the New Deal. In so many ways, our politics today, especially what we witnessed last night with the Georgia governor signing that legislation, our politics today have been overdetermined by the terrors and panic of the so-called forgotten American, a panic rooted I believe in the unsettling sense that the whiteness of this country was and is under siege. What we saw in the steps of the Capitol and what we're seeing in state houses across the country are those Americans in full revolt in the face of the prospect that their world is dying. James Baldwin's words continue to be relevant, at least to me. Quote, the horror is that America changes all the time without ever changing at all, without ever changing at all. So, you know, over these years, we have experienced a hyperpolarized political environment that reflects, you know, the deep divisions within the country. White, black, rural, urban, rich, poor, Republican, Democrat. All of those divisions are in full view. And just over the last few weeks, we've witnessed the ugliness of this uh, current moment as we've seen an uptick in violence against Asian Americans, the horror, the horror of what happened in Atlanta with eight uh, people killed, six of whom were Asian American. This is in some ways a reflection of the deep unease and panic at the heart of this changing America. And in the midst of this hyperpolarization, it feels as if the institutions and norms of our democracy are collapsing right in front of our bloodshot eyes. But more importantly, and, and I think you know this as well, all too well in this moment that we can't forget, COVID-19 continues to ravage the country. I mean, we're witnessing a level of death that we haven't seen since the Civil War. And Americans are dying alone, many of them. And those who love them must grieve with the regret of not being able to say goodbye properly. And we know who are dying disproportionately, right? those essential workers, those who have to take public transportation. We know that the virus has metastasized within the extant fissures in our society. COVID has revealed deep healthcare disparities and housing insecurity and a wide range of, it's almost as if like a blue dye has been shot into the social body, revealing where all the sickness is located. Hmm? Our economy, is in, in many ways in tatters, even though we've seen the uptick uh, in unemployment numbers, well, down tick, I don't know how one would describe it, right? But millions are still unemployed and hunger continues to grip the nation. But the top 1% continues to thrive. They're getting richer as death travels from door to door still. Even in the midst of all that we are experiencing now, we can't lose sight of the fact that thousands of Americans are dying every day. 
then you combine what I've just described with the shooting of Jacob Blake, of course, in Kenosha, Wisconsin, the police killing of Trayford Pillar in Lafayette, Louisiana, the public murder of George Floyd in Minneapolis, the death of Breonna Taylor in Louisville, Kentucky, the death of Rayshard Brooks in Atlanta, of Ahmaud Arbery, of Casey Goodson, of Walter Wallace, I could go on. And we've witnessed people over these summers in the streets protesting what has been obvious to many of us for generations that this country supposedly committed to the basic principles of democracy, that in this country, the lives of black people, as Dr. Hart said, are less valued than others. And this has been part of the challenge of our time. Right? How do we imagine being together differently? In so many ways, we face a moral reckoning in this moment, a fundamental challenge to what we mean by we the people. And that fact begs the question, how do we imagine moving forward in the face of all of this, in the face of the carnage left by COVID-19, in the face of the ugliness that we saw on January 6th, in the face of the ugliness that we see across state legislatures in this country, in the face of the ugliness, the brokenness that has led to 10 people being murdered senselessly in Boulder, Colorado. In so many ways, it feels as if America is broken. We know that for some calls for unity are merely appeals to maintain the status quo, to leave unaccountable those who threaten to topple our democracy. The sacking of the Capitol, the effort to disenfranchise folks have to be understood as part, in my, in my view, as part of the racial reckoning we face in this country today. There, that What happened on January 6th was a revolt, revolt predicated on white grievance and white resentment and white hatreds. And the question we must ask ourselves is what are we to do about it all? How might we think of ourselves moving forward? Some of us want to turn to page too quickly, to return to what, what, whatever was understood as a sense of normalcy. Some are appealing to unity, reaching for a new ground, for consensus amid the deep divisions that shape the Republic. Now, none of this will matter if we fail to confront the central contradiction at the heart of the matter. What some are calling the big lie about the presidential election that Democrats stole the election from Trump, that lie rests on an even bigger lie that constitutes the through line of American history. That lie says that only white Americans matter, that only white voters matter, that White people ought to be valued more than others in this country. Remember the Faulkner quote from Requiem for a Nun. The past is never dead, it's not even past. Now, some are willing to name the lies about the election, but they seem a bit reluctant to name the bigger lie that lurks beneath it all. It seems to me if we are to be sincere, if we are sincere, and the question of sincerity is always a vexing issue in this country. But if we are to be sincere, we have to face the insidious workings of this lie if we are to imagine America anew. The time has come for us to examine ourselves for who we really are and in the full light of what we have done. And we must do so without the crutch of our myths and legends about American exceptionalism, legends that protect our innocence. That examination must involve an attempt to use Baldwin's words to find out what is really happening here. We tell ourselves that we are an example of democracy achieved, that we are the shining city on the hill. That's Reagan's kind of adaptation of John Winthrop's model of Christian charity sermon. But these stories aim to conceal the contradiction at the heart of this fragile experiment in democracy. Baldwin put it this way in 1964, quote, the people who settled the country had a fatal flaw. They could recognize a man when they saw one, they knew he wasn't anything else but a man. But since they were Christian, and since they had already decided that they came here to establish a free country, the only way to justify the role this chattel was playing in one's life was to say that he was not a man. For if he wasn't, then no crime had been committed. That lie, Baldwin says, is the basis of our present trouble, end quote. What we know is that America has been and continues to be a place where the belief that white people matter more affects the distribution of advantage and disadvantage, that we have created a way of life where some are valued and have standing, while others must experience what philosophers describe as a generalized sense of disregard. 
We saw this in the way the mob behaved on January 6th. They felt a sense of possession of the country, had little to no fear of the police as they desecrated the Capitol. It was a stark contrast of a different quality of, different quality of expression of citizenship and an attenuated citizenship for others that this place belongs to them and the rest of us should simply shut up and be grateful. In those moments, and bear with me, I'm trying to get to something here. In those moments, like these, when we're in a moment of crisis where it feels as if the country is collapsing, unraveling right in front of our eyes, we have, when we have had in these moments, when we've had a chance to imagine America new, what have we have witnessed the reassertion of this belief, this belief that white people ought to be valued more than others, and the lie that provides it cover. In these moments where we have an opportunity to imagine ourselves otherwise, we have doubled down on our ugliness. This is why history matters, it haunts. Think about the Civil War and Radical Reconstruction, what history and historians refer to as the second founding. Here we see the formation of the modern US nation state, the passage of the Civil War amendments, the 13th, 14th, and 15th amendments, where we get ideally this conception of citizenship untethered from the ideas of race, where we get our notions of, of, of due process. What did we get in response? We got Jim Crow in the South. Frederick Douglass lived long enough to see Abraham Lincoln sign the Emancipation Proclamation and the state of Mississippi sign the first Jim Crow law. Hmm. He would refer to those who turned their back on the radical democratic vision of reconstruction as the apostles of forgetfulness. What else did we see in response? We saw convict leasing where the state deployed the police force, start the criminal justice system to conscript black labor to help build cities like Birmingham, what historians call another form of slavery. And of course, we saw the ideology of Anglo-Saxonism guiding our imperial efforts across the globe at the very moment in which we're consolidating the racial regime of, a part of Jim Crow in the South, the US is are annexing places like, like Guam and the Philippines, bringing millions of people of color under its rule and exporting Jim Crow segregation, white supremacist ideology into those places. Mm. In that moment in which we could imagine ourselves otherwise, we double down on our ugliness because we believed that white people matter more than others. Think about another historical coordinate, the black freedom struggle of the mid 20th century, which I've argued or suggested that the insurrection on January 6th and the efforts to disenfranchise black voters is in some ways a logical extension of the backlash against that moment. But think about the black freedom struggle of the mid 20th century, what historians call the second reconstruction where we saw the passage of the Civil Rights Act of 64, 1964, the Voting Rights Act of 1965, where we saw attempts to usher in a more robust form of citizenship for black Americans. What did we get in response? We got calls for law and order. They put in the put down, put in place the building blocks, right, of the carceral state. We saw the tax revolt in California, which led to the shredding of the social safety net and the upending of the basic assumptions of the New Deal. And we eventually saw the election of Ronald Reagan just 12 years after the passage of the Fair Housing Act of 1968, the last piece of major, major legislation of the great society. Just 12 years later, Reagan is elected to undo it all. In each moment, when the nation had a chance to imagine itself otherwise, we saw the ugliness of this idea that white people ought to matter more. And we doubled down on that ugliness and the bodies left in its wake. I'm thinking about this moment uh, in Jessman Ward's amazing novel, Seeing Unburied Sing. Mm -hmm. It's an extraordinary moment that she's talking about, right? Those bodies and the cost, the consequences of this moment. Look at, listen at the language. The branches are full. They are full with ghosts, two or three, all the way up to the top, to the feathered leaves. There are women and men and boys and girls, some of them near to babies. They crouch, looking at me. Black and brown in the closest near baby, smoke white. None of them reveal their deaths, but I see it in their eyes, their great black eyes. They perch like birds, but look as people. They speak with their eyes. 
He raped me and suffocated me until I died. I put my hands up and he shot me eight times. She locked me in the shed and starved me to death while I listened to my babies playing with her in the yard. They came in my cell in the middle of the night and they hung me. They found I could read and they dragged me out to the barn and gouged my eyes. Before they beat me, still I was sick. And he said I was an abomination. And Jesus said, suffer little children, so let her go. And he put me under the water and I couldn't breathe. Eyes blink as the sun blazes and winks below the forest line so that the ghosts catch the color, reflect the red. The sun making scarlet plumage of the clothes they wear. Rags and britches, t-shirts and tignons, fedoras and hoodies. The costs, the cost of our doubling down on the ugliness, rest in our dead, our dead who did not die right, who continue to haunt. The past is never past, the past is not even, the past is never dead, the past is not even past. Hmm? We must remember, we must understand that racial equality is not the random result of a collection of bad choices on the part of various individuals. It is the consequence of policy decisions, of deliberate efforts to build a society that instantiates what I've called the value gap. We need to understand that the vaunted American middle class came into existence as a result of the policies of the New Deal, but those policies were passed on the basis of the exclusion of Black folk at the very moment in which we saw FHA loans giving right these the ability to white Americans to own homes without, you know, guaranteed by federal government, Black folk cut off as we saw FHA not extending those loans to Black folk, banks redlining their communities, the very moment in which we see the vaunted American middle class putting away dollars that would be the wealth that they would accumulate to pass on to generations, black folk are locked out. We have to understand dual labor markets, dual housing markets, residential segregation, school segregation, banking discrimination, all of this produced inequality in this country. And those were choices made. Now, if that is true, what is needed to respond to it will have to be just as deliberate. To echo Dr. King, we will have to engage in a revolution of value. We will have to commit ourselves to building a country that affirms the dignity and sanctity of every human being, no matter the color of their skin, their zip code or where they're from, who they love, their gender or ability. It will involve finally uprooting this idea that some among us because of the color of their skin ought to be valued more than others. Now, it's clear, at least to me, that changing whoever is in the White House won't settle any of this. I pray that we do not trade one fantasy for another, that President Biden's election somehow, for some, affirms America's inherent goodness and puts a grateful republic back to sleep. We must understand that presidential elections alone do not settle the question of who we take ourselves to be. The answer to that question must emerge in what we do now together. I think we have to shift the frame. We have to be bold and visionary and step outside of our comfort zones right where we are in places like the University of Vermont. If we are to really get to the heart of the matter, we must stop fighting on the old battlefield, shift the ground beneath our feet. And, when, and we can do this if we join together to face the cascading crises that threaten to shatter the very foundations of the polity. We have to be better midwives. And this will involve imagining our relationship to each other differently. We'll involve imagining our being together differently. We have to tell ourselves a different story about who we are. We cannot tell ourselves the story of American virtue that secures our virtue. In fact, James Baldwin insisted that the country confront the lie that sustains its innocence. As he put it in the fire next time, it is not permissible that the authors of devastation should also be innocent. It is the innocence that constitutes the crime. As he put it in Nothing Personal in 1964, an essay he wrote for uh, this photographic uh, book he did with Richard Avington, he said, we are afraid to reveal ourselves, quote, because we trust ourselves so little. 
And in this labyrinth, the person is desperately trying not to find out what he really thinks. Therefore, the truth cannot be told even about one's attitudes. Baldwin says, we live by lies. And not only, for example, about race, but about our very natures. The lie has penetrated our most private moments in the most secret chambers of our hearts, end quote. This country has never been a beacon of virtue. It's not an example of democracy achieved, nor is it the shining city on the hill. We tell ourselves this, these stories in order to protect ourselves from what we've done. Baldwin understood that the problem in the United States went beyond who occupied the White House or the latest example of American racism, we have to get to the rot at the heart of the matter. And this requires that we deconstruct all that the nation holds sacred, tell the truth so that we might release ourselves into a different way of being in the world. Americans are trapped in a history we refuse to know but carry within us. The terrors and panic we experience today have everything to do with the gap between who we imagine ourselves to be and who deep down we really are. And that the nation actively evades confronting this gap locks the country into a kind of perpetual adolescence where those who desperately hold on to the American myth as some kind of new Eden refuse to grow up. And for Baldwin, Condemnation to eternal youth is a synonym for corruption. Imagine being stuck forever in never, never land. What's distinctive about lost boys and lost girls? They don't want to grow up. They don't want to take responsibility or be held to account for anything they do. I cannot help but connect this insight to what we're witnessing today across state legislatures in this country and what we witnessed on January 6th, and what we have witnessed over the last four years. Americans who refuse to grow up, revel in the fantasy that Trumpism represents, that ours must remain a white nation in the vein of old Europe, all along, at least to me, all of this feels as if a kind of suppressed terror and panic lurks beneath the surface of the rants and hatreds that the scenes are unraveling and revealing the true monstrosity hidden underneath a cheap ass MAGA hat and t-shirt. How do we keep fighting when the time seems so dark? How do we muster the energy to keep pushing this boulder up the hill when America changes all the time without ever changing at all? How do we imagine an equitable space right, where we affirm the talents and capacities of everyone in our midst? Where we begin with the fundamental assumption about the sacredness of every human personality? Baldwin had to ask himself those questions. He had to come to terms with what happened to the black freedom struggle in such a short period of time. He had to understand the angry cries of black power, the white fantasy that was Ronald Reagan. He had to tell the truth even as cancer ravaged his body. And here we are today, even with his witness in hand and the forces unleashed by the latest version of the American fantasy threaten as they have always done to destroy the very foundations of the country. Oh, we got some difficult days ahead. In the end, America has to choose whether we, it will finally become a genuinely multiracial democracy. There's a choice in front of us. And this will involve grappling with the past that haunts grappling with that past that continues, right, to have the nation by the throat. We have to tell the truth. <laughs> we have to ask that hard question, how shall we put ourselves in touch with reality? To put aside our desire for comfort and safety, to put aside the illusions that Eugene O'Neill talked about, an ice man cometh to put them aside and confront who we are. That's at the heart of the perfectionist impulse. We can't ascend to a higher self until we accept the self that we are. 
that acceptance becomes the condition to leave it behind. But if you refuse to deal with the ghosts, oh, the monstrous consequences that follow in terms of our dispositions and practices. We have to, as Baldwin put it, describe us to ourselves as we now are. And we must do so, as Henry James would say, at the pitch of passion. We have to tell ourselves the truth about our past. The past that continues to haunt our present living. Understand that George Floyd or Breonna Taylor or Jacob Blake or Walter Wallace or Casey Goodson or Adrian Hill or Trayvon Martin or Mike Brown or Ayanna Jones or Sandra Bland or I could go on and on that all of these are the dead. These dead are simply the latest victims of the slave codes that have shaped the way black communities have been policed in this country since the abolition of slavery. The point here is not to suggest that black people are still slaves and that police are slave catchers. Rather, Baldwin captures with the image, the logic behind why black people are treated so that the slave code brings into view, or the slave code brings into view a host of assumptions about who's valued and who's not, about who has standing in this country and who can be treated with a generalized sense of disregard. Tell the truth. You have to confront the real impulse that's driving what these folk are doing in state legislatures across the country. They insist that this country must remain white and you have to make the choice. You cannot stand silently by as America doubles down on its ugliness again. Who will we be? We have to understand that the trouble is deeper than we think. It's not just about loud racists, about those who stand silently by because they're comfortable and they are committed to safety, the illusion of safety. Baldwin says we have to recognize, quote, that the trouble is deeper than we wish to think. The trouble is in us and we will never conquer that unbearable human isolation. We will never establish human communities until we stare our ghastly failures in the face, end quote. This is the challenge we all must take up. I'm coming home, I promise. You know, we stand on a knife's edge that the background conditions that make our democracy possible have cracked. We have to dare to be otherwise. Do everything in our power to break from the old frames that have us trapped in categories that blind us to the humanity of those right in front of us. We have to understand that racial inequality that the pursuit of racial equality is not a philanthropic enterprise, is not an act of charity. Equality is not the possession of white people to give to us. We have to change the frame. We have to tell ourselves the truth about our failures and we have to risk everything to do something bold and visionary right now to unmask the panic at the root. In the end, we cannot hide from each other. When we imprison our fellows in categories that cut off their humanity from our own, we end up imprisoning ourselves. We can't hide behind the mask either. We have to run toward the trouble that makes us afraid of life. We have to accept the beauty and ugliness of who we are in our most vulnerable moments in communion with each other. There, I believe, I have to believe, I must believe. There, in that moment of vulnerability, a profound mutuality develops and becomes the basis for a genuine democratic community where all can flourish, if we so choose. That choice is before us as a nation. That choice is before you, the University of Vermont. Will you tinker around the edges or will you choose fundamentally to be otherwise? What will you do? Thank you so much. Dr. Glaude, thank you so much for your sage, prescient words this morning. I personally have goosebumps. As you said earlier, history matters and it haunts. I think that you've left many of us 
with a lot to reflect on and think about. So thank you again so much. Uh, my name is Paul, he, him, his pronouns, and I'm a staff member in the Division of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion. And at this time, we'd love for you to answer some questions from our audience. Uh, we've got an excellent one queued up here for you from Professor Emery right here at the university. So Dr. Emery said she was struck by an interview you gave after your book on Baldwin came out and learn from you how, as a homosexual, Baldwin was marginalized by main figures in the civil rights movement. She's well aware that we are a diverse nation composed of complex individuals. So with all of that in mind, she was wondering, how does one explain the presence of people of color, some leaders even, in groups like the Proud Boys? Can this be attributed to toxic masculinity or an author authoritarian political sensibility? So a lot there in that uh, in those questions. Yeah, yeah, and you know, there that's, it's a version of a question that that I confronted after uh, the November election when we saw large numbers or not large numbers, a relatively uh, uptick in black men voting for. Donald Trump, Hispanic men, Asian men voting for Donald Trump. So on the one hand, I think toxic masculinity is, is a way to account for it. Uh, another authoritarian impulses, of course, but one of the things that we have to insist upon is that communities are not homogeneous. That, that, that white communities don't have a monopoly on selfishness and greed. That if we understand black folks as human beings, then they have knuckleheads and assholes, excuse my language, as a part of it. They have folks that I disagree with, right? And so I think it's really important for us to understand uh, that you have folk who are self-interested, who are committed to policies uh, that would benefit their 401ks, that, would, that will uh, deepen their pockets, that selfishness and greed are not the possession of any one group that it can evidence itself across uh, uh, broad swaths of American life. So uh, I think the expectation that because one is black or because one is, is a person of color that you ought to hold the same political position, that expectation is actually a kind of mirrored reflection of certain kinds of stereotype, stereotypical assumptions about people of color, right? We kind of echo it, we mirror it in our assumption that we all should hold the same political positions. So, so I understand exactly what you're saying, but I always say to myself, those folks don't have a monopoly on ugliness, right? Ugliness can evidence itself in all, all segments of American life. We've got another great question from Chris Danforth. First of all, he says, thank you for the terrific keynote. Uh, with its capacity to empower the voices of regular people, be it in service of social justice movements like Black Lives Matter, or in planning the Capitol insurrection, how do you view the role of social media in building a better future? It's complex, right? The first thing we need to understand is that social media uh, platforms are, are, are not public sector platforms, right? That is to say they're owned by corporations. Their aim is to generate surplus value. So we need to first understand what social platforms are all about. Right, they're, 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 they're complex uh, spaces for democratic life. So on the one hand, uh, I wanna recognize that they're, corp they're, they're privately owned. Um, two, that we know that over the last, since November and throughout last year, that they could be manipulated and used to, 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 to perpetuate all sorts of disinformation, to stoke division and the like. But on the other hand, Social media is, you know, has this amazing democratizing kind of uh, consequence, where it gives uh, everyday ordinary Americans not only the ability to organize, right, very quickly. We saw how social media was used in Ferguson and in Baltimore. Uh, mm -hmm. We saw how it was used in, 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 um, you know, uh, Iran and Egypt and across the globe. Uh, uh, so we know it, it, it enables organizing, but it also gives each individual a platform to project her views, right? So you, 
you can, how can I put this? It's like when I was at Morehouse in Atlanta, uh, Outkast, the, you know, that famous rap group didn't have the contract. So they were selling their tapes out of their trunk at the, at the gate of Spelman College, right? And what it, what, what it kind of pretended was this kind of fragmentation of the music industry, right? That you can begin to move product in a different way, like Too Short and out Oakland and all these other places, right? And so I think social media has this leveling impulse that has this democratizing implication, which is really, really important for uh, creating the conditions under which we can hold, hold certain kinds of powers in check, but it's complicated, Doc. It's complicated, Paul, in every way you can imagine. That it is, absolutely. We've got another, again, great question here from Juliet. Yeah. So when you talk about a moral reckoning, uh, Juliet wonders where religious traditions fit into this discussion. Uh, Juliet says, faith gives us our sense of up and down, right and wrong, justice and injustice, love and hate. How do we re-envision the role of religious traditions in the United States? And she just adds that Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. tried to do this um, and his marches reflected right, a, a wide diversity of people, but right, it also resulted in his assassination as well. Well, there's an argument that has to be had within faith traditions. So there's no necessary relationship between uh, and I'm thinking here of the, Abraham, the Abrahamic traditions. There's no necessary relationship between uh, people of faith and a progressive politics. We've seen over and over again, the kind of intimate relationship between a certain kind of conservative white evangelical uh, articulation of Protestantism uh, and a certain kind of politics right, where the adjectives matter more than the noun, conservative, white, Right, matter more than Christianity in some way. So there's an argument that has to be had on, 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 on religious grounds about how we might understand the tradition. So the example for me is an evangelical leading the, the poor people's campaign. And that's Reverend William Barber and Reverend uh, Joanne Theo, Theo Harris, right? And here we have a particular kind of rendering of, of a Christian witness. Um, and you know, in the United States, American Christendom has always been complicated. Frederick Douglass, who was an art, you know, was a devout member of the African Methodist Episcopal Zion Church, uh, said that the church, the steeple, you know, the church steeple was right next to the uh, the slave auction block. There's always been this kind of intimate relationship between American Christendom and the serpent wrapped around the legs of the table upon which the Declaration of Independence was signed, the serpent of slavery. Right, the serpent that has always kind of hovered about the church house in some ways. Um, so to answer the question succinctly, it seems to me that one has to have arguments within those traditions, right, within the tradition in which you occupy to speak to uh, the reality of suffering in the world. There's no guarantee that those who hold faith will do so. In fact, they may very well use their faith as justification for their willful ignorance in some way. There's, there's so many layers <laughs> to what you are saying and so many, uh, you know, I wish we could just spend uh, the rest of the day here on kind of just raveling all of these truths. Um, I want to obviously make sure we go to some more of these questions because they are starting to, uh, to come in now swiftly. So Lisa Barr asks, when will the someday come? Black people have been working hard for equality for well over 400 years. And yet there is a belief that someday we will be and will have the equality that we deserve as humans. So in your opinion, Dr. Claude, when is someday? I have no idea. Um... There, there's a, I, I used a reference in my talk about the boulder, having to push the boulder up the hill again. It's Sisyphean, right? And what one comes to know, I don't wanna make Baldwin too much of, of I, you know, I don't wanna make him too much of an existentialist here uh, to read him as Camus, but 
the, the idea here is not so much, you know, the finish. The idea is the struggle. Because I don't know when, if, when, I don't have an end in view. I know what I'm fighting for, but I don't know when it will be achieved. And so in order to be able to pick up the pieces in these moments and begin again, we have to understand what Talib Kweli, the, the hip hop artist called the beautiful struggle, right? Where we have to find beauty and meaning in the ongoing work to ensure that our children and our children's children can imagine a better life. I know that I found myself um, grappling with despair and disillusionment. I kept saying, look what they've, they've done it again. They're doing it again. And now my baby, he's no longer a baby, he's 24 now. But now my son will have to deal with this. And his children may have to deal with this. Right. Um, I do know that that someday will not come unless we are courageous to risk everything in our moment. That's the key. Right. But at the end of the day, Paul, I don't know. I have no I have no idea. And some days that lack of knowledge drives me to my liquor cabinet. <laughs> uh, but, you know, it is what it is. I mean, I often share, you know, this is. Uh, obviously, it, it took us many, 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 many generations to get to where we are today. It's, I, I believe, right, going to take us many, many, many generations to get out of this work as well. But I do appreciate that sentiment that we do need to kind of give it, a, give it our all, right, each and every one of us now, um, or, right, that day will never, ever come. Mm. Our, our next question is from Chris Kaliba. Again, thank you. Uh, he thanks you, excuse me, for your time with us today. And he asks... Vermont may be politically progressive, but it is still far from being, it is still, excuse me, far behind in realizing the vision of an authentic multicultural democracy. Can you provide us with some advice on the role that institutions of higher education like UVM? And I'm sorry, I just lost this question here. So I, I can see it. Okay, great. Okay. Uh, where institutions like UVM can and should be playing to cultivate sustainable social and racial justice in our communities. There you go. Yes. Yeah. Um, you know, first of all, let me just simply admit out loud that I don't have all the answers. Right. It's it's important that we that we say this because, you know, there's the presumption that 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 certain folk, because they have platforms, can can answer every. I'm out here struggling just like you are, trying to figure this thing out. I think uh, institutions of higher education can, can do this work by trying to look like the world in which they inhabit. Uh, or, and I, don't, I didn't say the state or the community of Burlington, right? I said the world in which they inhabit. What would it mean to be truly committed to racial equity, uh, to a diverse uh, uh, University of Vermont? How do you give uh, people access to the social capital that that university affords. Now, this means particularly a lot for people for places like Princeton and Harvard and UVM and University of North Carolina and universe, you know, the elite state institutions and these private institutions. So what does it mean? What are what are we doing at the level of admissions? What are we doing at the level of faculty hiring? What are we doing at the level of administration? What are we doing at the level of the board? Right to have a university that reflects the world that we inhabit, and I don't mean just simply kind of token representation. I'm talking about transformational representation, um, and to actually develop the metrics, right, to assess whether or not we're doing right by what we say we're committed to. What are our admissions goals? What are our our goals in terms of a diversified faculty? What are our goals in terms of a diverse administration? And not to just simply channel people of color into student services, but at every mat, at every level of leadership, not to just simply coordinate us all off into DEI or diversity offices of diversity and inclusion, right? So part of what we have to understand is that social capital is reproduced in the United States by way of who has access to it. People are not arguing, for example, Paul, about affirmative action at the local community college. That's not where that debate is happening. Mm -hmm. That debate is who has access to those degrees that will give them access 
to, to leadership and power, right? And so what flagship institutions like University of Vermont must do is to figure out how to leverage its, its influence, right? To break free of a, of a society that is organized along the lines of the value gap. Give you one example of this at the level of the board and how the institution functions. If you're committed to genuine diversity, and you evidence that in the way in which you uh, set aside contracts for minority businesses to use the wealth of University of Vermont in order to build wealth among communities of color. You can then leverage your influence with your contractors. You have a commitment in terms of what you're doing. Then you say, well, if you're gonna do business with us, what are you doing to do X, Y, and Z? a whole number of different ways in which institutions can leverage their influence, their impact, their power uh, to, to, to uh, begin to fundamentally transform how we go about doing our work in this country. I think that um, there's, again, there's a lot to, uh, to think about in that, but I, I just really appreciate the encouragement, right, to be transformational and then to really have these metrics that are, are measuring, right, that you hold yourself as an institution that is accountable, right, to, to your stated goals. I think, again, that resonates a, a lot with many people on this uh, session right now. Sandy uh, Bermanzon asks another great question. So in working towards truly seeing ourselves, learning our true history, reflecting on the ways in which we are accomplices in the place of our country today, what are some concrete steps that we can take to work together as communities to make local and lasting change that can be hopefully spread out into the country at large? That's a wonderful question. You know, I think um, because all of the innovation, because of, of the dysfunction of, 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 of the Beltway of Washington, DC, I think most of the innovation is gonna happen at the local county and state level. And it seems to me that uh, communities ought to commit themselves to building what I'm calling a public infrastructure of care, not a social safety net. That's that charitable philanthropic approach, but a public infrastructure of care reflects a different kind of social and moral contract we have with each other. That is to say, we're going to live together in such a way that we're going to announce our obligations to each other uh, in the very policies that guide our living, that shape our living. And what do I mean? A public infrastructure of care would have at least three legs. And all three of those legs, I think, impact or can be uh, impacted by uh, local communities, right? Or can be implemented through local communities. One, one is this, well, not so much the first leg, but healthcare uh, is the first leg of this public infrastructure of care. We're gonna say to each other that if you get sick, we got you. You shouldn't go broke because cancer, because of cancer. You shouldn't go broke, you shouldn't have to choose between putting food on the table and getting your insulin, right? We're gonna have this basic obligation to each other that every American not only will have access to, edu uh, to healthcare, but will have access, right, to, to quality healthcare, can afford it, it will be their right, right? Because what COVID-19 has revealed to us is that our healthcare system is broken across the board, that racial bias, right, is not only evidence in its delivery, but in access, right? And so what we know very clearly is that we need to establish, right, um, uh, a commitment to each other around healthcare. The second leg would be a living wage or edu you know, education, living wage slash education. What do I mean? If you work 40 hours a week, it seems to me that you should be able to make enough to put food on the table and keep a roof over your head. Mm -hmm. it, took us four, it took black folk 400 years to get to $7.25 an hour. Can you imagine? Right. So what does it mean if you're working 40 hours a week and you can barely put food on the table, barely afford rent? Think about Berlin, right? Barely afford rent. So, and then the last is to shift the discussion from law and order, which is a discussion that's really rooted in carcerality to a discussion of safety and, and security. Mm -hmm. What does it mean to think about communities that are safe and secure? So I would say to the question, right? What can we do? What are these three pillars? And how can a local municipality address them directly to ensure that everyone in their communities have access to quality health care, can afford quality health care, right? Can ensure that every, no matter your zip code, no matter your color, 
will have access to a great education and then to ensure living wage in those spaces. What else, what else can we do to shift the form of policing from the idea of law and order to an idea of safety and security, that every community should be safe. That means we need to invest in mental health care. We need to invest in social services and the like, and to think about safety and security beyond this idea of carcerality. That's a long-winded answer from a guy who's not a policy person, but that's the beginning of how I would answer. Yeah. Oh, the, 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 they're again, fantastic answers. And again, there's so much there. And I think, you know, the good news is that there is some local activity going on uh, here in the greater Burlington area in all three of those areas, uh, but we need to expand those efforts all across the rest of the state as well. But thank you for that. I do wanna just give you a heads up that we have a lot more questions uh, that unfortunately we're not gonna be able to get to all of them, um, but we do have just a couple more minutes before we're gonna to start to wrap up here. And I think that this next question from Catherine Dundee uh, is gonna be uh, one that you enjoy. Uh, a sister from Spelman, class of 91, thanks you, her Morehouse brother, for oppression and powerful talk. And Catherine's question is, how do those of us who have been and continue to be in the struggle maintain stamina and encourage contribution from those who have been on the sidelines or are just coming into recognizing the long struggle? Well, that's a hard question to answer. And it's always great to, to hear from a Spellman sister. Um, you have to cultivate your elsewheres, as I put it in the book, Begin Again. And what I mean by elsewhere, you have to find those spaces, those communities of love that you can retreat to where you can replenish. Those communities of love that allow you to laugh full belly laughs, to cuss at the top of your lungs, to rage. And when your, sp and when your knees buckle, they will stiffen your spine, mm -hmm. right? And those communities of love are, give you the requisite distance from the operations of power so that you can then re-enter the fray. So you gotta engage in self-care. Uh, you gotta have people who, who aren't enamored with who you are uh, as, as an activist or as a pundit or who just love you for you and love you to death unconditionally. Um, and, 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 and in some ways allow them to love you back on your feet, you know? Um, and what do we do with those who are just entering the fray? We, you know, for those of you who ran track, tell them this is not a sprint, baby. This is not a 40 yard dash. You're gonna have to pace yourself. This is a long distance race. Mm -hmm. So take it one step at a time, one step at a time and not over overreach, but as Miss Ella Baker, one of the great organizers and one of the great political theorists of our time used to say, the problem is right in front of you. Address it uh, directly, but don't sprint. It's a long distance race. That it is, Dr. Claude, that it is. Um, I, there are so many excellent questions that have come in. Um, I just want to, again, uh, apologize to all of those who have submitted these excellent questions that unfortunately we are not going to be able to get to them at the moment. But Dr. Glad, that last thought about these communities of elsewhere, and you know, sometimes yes, it is at least it seems like those easy things to to, to think about and to be able to do. But in particular, over the past year, uh, in these right circumstances under the pandemic, just how important those are, right, for all of us to be able to sustain uh, for the long haul. Yeah. So. I, Folks, unfortunately, our, our time has come to a close. Um, we hope that you will continue to engage with us or with Dr. Glaude on social media. Please feel free to use the hashtag BBJ13 if you would like to do so. Um, I would like to thank you, Dr. Glaude, once again for sharing your time and energy and patience and just expertise with us today. If we were in person, I am sure everybody would be on their feet right now, giving you a standing ovation uh, and asking you to stay for more. Um, and hopefully in the very, very near future, we will be able to have you here uh, at the University of Vermont for another event. Thank you so much. Of course. Uh, to those of you who are in the audience, we'd like to invite you to please take a couple of minutes 
to fill out an evaluation. Um, it will really help us as we plan for future sessions. You can follow the URL that's right there um, on the slide, and it's also in chat. Just go.uvm.edu slash bbj13 eval. And later today, we have one more keynote to close out BBJ 13, featuring none other than Judy Shepard. And we hope you will join us for that session too. So on behalf of everybody from the Office of the Vice President for Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion, and from here at the University of Vermont, thank you all for attending this keynote. Take care, be safe, and please enjoy the rest of your day.